All right, well, hello everybody and welcome to Open Access Week and to this panel discussion. Uh, before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation as the traditional custodians of the land that I'm currently situated on, um, as well as their deep history and continuing contribution to this region. Um, I'd also like to pay respect to their elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait people from other communities who are here today. Um, I also invite you all to reflect on the land that you're currently situated on. Also to get practicalities out of the way, uh, we'll be recording this session, so please keep your microphone and camera off. Uh, and the recording will be made available on the website in the coming week if you want to share it with colleagues. Uh, you can also add questions into the chat and we'll aim to get uh, a couple brought up at the end. So this is the first in a series of international events throughout this week collated together by Spark, uh, and those in Australia and New Zealand are being organized by Open Access Australasia. So I would like to thank my excellent colleagues on the organizing committee for bringing this all together. Today, we're going to be taking a broad view of the knowledge ecosystem. And by that, I mean, how research is funded, how its results are shared with the people who need them, uh, whether that's researchers or uh, other interested parties. And for this, I'm joined by Cathy Foley, who you'll most likely know as Australia's chief scientist. Uh, in addition to science leadership roles like her current position and her previous one at CSIRO, she's also had uh, hands-on knowledge of academic publishing. She's the editor-in-chief of the academic journal Superconductor Science and Technology. Uh, and she also has experience in both fundamental and highly applied research. Um, Andrew Jaspin, who hasn't yet been able to join us, but will hopefully be able to turn up later, um, will bring a, a journalist's perspective, both from his time as editor and editor-in-chief at a number of newspapers, but particularly from founding The Conversation, which is an open access news site written by academics uh, with assistance from journalists. And he's also the director of the Global Academy hosted at Monash University. Prue Torrance is executive director of research quality and priorities at the NHMRC, which is one of the world's largest medical research funders. Uh, and so has a view from the very start of the research pipeline uh, and how the funding landscape affects research practices and she has a portfolio encompassing everything from uh, research rigor and, effic uh, and efficiency through to transparency and innovation. And lastly, Toby Hudson is a chemist at the University of Sydney and associate head of school for education in the School of Chemistry. Uh, he's also one of Australia's leading Wikipedians, having contributed since back in 2004 uh, writing and illustrating scientific and Australian content for the encyclopedia uh, and also working extensively these days on the site's machine readable cousin Wikidata. So uh, thank you all for being here. Um, to, to start off with, uh, I'd like to ask a bit about who open access as an idea affects. Um, so we often think about open access in terms of researchers and academics, but my question to each of you is, um, who are the other stakeholders for whom access to research knowledge matters? Uh, and I guess I'll ask that to Cathy Foley initially in, in your role in working with government. Yeah, well, hi everyone and thank you and apologies that for some reason just before we came on my computer decided to look, let my camera work. So it's just voice today and I hope that will work all right. I'm coming from the um, lands of the Camaragal people up in the northern part of Sydney. I pay my respects to all this past and present and those emerging. Uh, look, this is really important. I think everyone needs to have access to research literature and that it's something which if we think about government who's making uh, policy based on, on the best information, I was quite surprised that the public service who provides a lot of advice to government has very limited access to research literature. You think about industry, if you think about the general public, professionals, uh, what we're, we're seeing is a hunger for information and that's been demonstrated by 
people's willingness to engage with social media and pick up information from there and really be confused as to what is the material or the information you can trust as opposed to this information that is just readily and cheaply available for free. So for that reason, I think um, what it's showing is a real hunger and a need for everyone in, in our um, community, both nationally and internationally, to have access to research literature. Well, it's really interesting to see how, how widely it affects people. Um, I guess also that that must be uh, of interest to you, Andrew. So I've just noticed that you have actually been here all along, but um, but I, for some reason, I, the link I sent you must have put you under my username. Um, uh, what's kind of that the view from a, a journalist's perspective? Thanks very much, Thomas. I don't know how I ended up being renamed as you, but uh, <laughs> there you are. Um, Kathy, I'm so sorry I can't actually see you because I haven't seen you for a while and although I can hear you, um, um, it's a shame about your camera. So anyway, in our, first of all, I should say, Kathy, I completely agree with everything you said a moment ago and I hope we don't end up agreeing furiously with everything that we all say. Um, as a journalist, uh, I'm going to make a very broad sweeping statement here, but um, as a journalist, um, I just want to remind everyone that the word journalism didn't exist until um, the 17th or early 18th century. Um, and the business model for most journalism, I exclude here public service broadcasting, has been underpinned by advertising. And that business model began falling apart in the mid 1995 uh, ish, um, and then really. Um, kind of started to fall apart at the beginning of the 21st century. Um, over the last 10, 15 years, the, 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 the funding model completely changed. Um, and uh, if you take Australia of, say, the 10 billion in advertising in Australia, about 6 billion of that now is taken by Google and Facebook. So it's drained the, the pond, as it were, uh, for funding for journalism. And as a result, there is a requirement to say, well, um, where are we now, how are we going to both fund and where are we going to get information that citizens can rely upon to enable them to be informed about society and to make informed decisions um, uh, uh, in terms of um, um, not, not just how to vote, but uh, on a whole range of issues. So. Um, into that, uh, and I'll just finish with this point, is I see the universities now, uh, and not just the universities, all those engaged in research as playing a much more important role. That doesn't mean to say they change what they're doing, but there needs to be a way to get that research uh, into the public arena to better inform citizens. Uh, and in a sense, to pick up some of the, the job that used to be done by journalism. Uh, I'll come back to how we need to make sure that information is reliable, but that's just by way of an opening uh, statement. Yeah, so I guess also, um, Toby, you might have something to say about that, because, uh, I mean, in addition to, to working in academia, you've done quite a lot of work with Wikipedia, is that right? Yes, so I, I've obviously always been privileged with great access to literature, uh, which is fantastic, but I'm, I'm deeply interested in making sure uh, that knowledge gets passed on to the public at large. And I suppose, therefore, I'm, I'm talking about that last step in the rung uh, of this ladder today uh, about disseminating right out to the public on a free platform that everyone can access and everyone can contribute to. And so obviously, uh, some of the issues Andrew has raised matter a lot to us. We uh, On Wikipedia, we're not funded at all by advertising and so we're relying on volunteerism and, and therefore all kinds of issues about uh, accuracy and uh, verifiability and so on raise their head very starkly on Wikipedia uh, and so we've got some insight into how that that could be managed uh, if if not solved. Um, and I guess you know uh, sort of a last view of, of the different stakeholders involved here. Um, Prue, of course, the NHMRC focuses mainly on medical research, but of course, it's also uh, focused on Australian research, right? The, you know, it's an Australian funding body. Um, so what does it look like from the funders perspective to be thinking about who ends up with the information 
that is uh, the result of the research funded by the NHMRC. Yeah, thanks, Thomas. It's interesting that you put the question in the context of um, funding Australian research, because one of the primary things that we're always concerned with is that internet research is an international endeavour um, and international engagement and research really drives and improves the overall quality and impact of research. So we have to have that in mind. Um, so I think thinking about the stakeholders um, who need access to the outputs of research and research publications, it's useful to think about it in, in terms of three key objectives. Um, one we've touched on already, which is really around equity, that idea of unrestrained access for all players in the system. Um, and when you put that in the context of um, international engagement, that's also around global access um, to improve the health outcomes and health and medical research sense. Um, we're also very interested in access by the users such as health and medical practitioners um, and even patients and, and health consumers is increasingly important. So that equity of unrestrained access um, to what is essentially you know, publicly funded research. The second objective I think that plays into it is about facilitating the actual use of the research, the use of the evidence that's produced. Um, and from a government perspective, which Cathy touched upon, um, policymakers having access to, to research outcomes directly is really important. But one of the things that NHMRC does um, is also engage in systematic reviews of evidence. So not just taking each publication on its own, but um, synthesizing and, and putting it all together into a package that tells you the state of the current evidence and takes into consideration the quality of it. And one of the things open access gives us uh, even more potential into the future is really large scale analyses, um, even kind of data and text mining, once everything is on a common interoperable platform that that can be done. So the use of evidence by policymakers and by practitioners is really critical. And then I think the third objective is around scientific literacy. Um, we're seeing more than ever that gap between public understanding of science and scientists understanding of science. Um, and there is something here, there might be some more work that needs to be done, but there is something here where open access can feed into closing that gap and starting to tackle scientific miscommunication. So, I mean, I can see from, from people's answers that there's, you know, a, a range of um, end users who benefit from, from how open access can work. But the, I mean, from the research point of view or from the person's, um, from the point of view of the person doing the research and then make, doing the work to disseminate that, it sounds as though it's a lot of additional effort with maybe no direct reward to them, it's direct reward to others. Um, so I guess the, the, the question is then how, how do we better reward and encourage these sorts of practices outside of sort of a pure altruistic um, idealism? Well, Thomas, it's Cathy here. Um, I actually have to question whether the researcher doesn't get a value. If you look at the information that comes through, uh, a Nature uh, Springer actually reported that open access journal articles get downloaded four times more and their normalised citation index is much higher. Significant, I, I don't know the actual number, but it's significantly higher. And as we use those sorts of metrics to decide at the moment, uh, what does good look like for a researcher? So how do we rank someone uh, or rank, rank a range of different researchers? Citations are a, a very important part of that. And it's um, one though at the moment, which is being made in balance because you have those who can afford to pay for open access and those who can't. And so therefore you have the potential to uh, add a, a boost to your, your metrics as comparative metrics by actually being open access. And, uh, and so therefore there is actually a personal, uh, a personal reward, which is seeing a whole range of people coming to a range of different arrangements to be able to identify or create the funds to be able to pay for open access when they want to have uh, particularly gold open access. Um, actually, Andrew, um, kind of leading on from that, did, um, how, did you find it difficult to convince academics to directly get involved in, in writing news articles, you know, say within, within the conversation? Um, because that seems like something that is outside the, the immediate experience of a lot of academics. Yes, so um, be before I launched the conversation, I was told a number of times um, 
and apologies to those listening to this, um, that um, if you want to try and get academics to write for you, good luck. Um, they, uh, you'll never get hold of them. They're impossible. They can't write. They don't stick to deadlines and all that kind of stuff. And, um, and the fact is that we have got, or we, 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 we have got some, something like, like about 20,000 Australian academics writing um, for the conversation. Now, um, that's out of a total population of roughly 100,000. So 20% have engaged. So you could argue, well, 80% don't want to be involved, but 20% is a large number. And to build on what Cathy was saying a moment ago, um, what has actually happened now within universities is increasingly there is a requirement to demonstrate that you have actually um, shared your knowledge or your, your research with, with wider society. And the way that's quite often uh, done is through the metrics that are provided by, say, the likes of The Conversation and others, which are collected from organizations like Altmetrics, which is part of um, the um, Springer Group. Um, and they provide extremely good uh, accounts of how many people have, have uh, picked up on social media, but also in publications elsewhere. And these are known, uh, the conversation is known as a semi-scholarly publication. Um, and those, um, that dashboard, it can be downloaded and can actually be given as part of your annual appraisal. And that annual appraisal can also lead to preferment or advancement, I should say. Um, that's one uh, aspect which we, which we found uh, was a real encouragement. But the others are softer ones, which are as follows that uh, on publication of the conversation, it could lead to a follow-up TV or radio interview or local paper. It can lead to invitations to speak about your subject, which could be just your local school or civic society, or it could be giving a paper at a conference. It can lead also to people being invited to write a book. It can be, uh, it could lead to travel. It can also lead most importantly to, um, to research projects, um, where you have colleagues overseas or elsewhere. So research collaboration falls through it. So there are all sorts of pluses that come from this. And of course, underpinning this all is a commitment to open access to make sure that this knowledge is opened up uh, and made as, as, as available as possible. But I want to just add one other, one other sort of uh, twist to that, which is to say that um, just making information available is powerful, but if you actually translate it into plain language, that's where you actually release its real power to as many people as possible. So it's not just an, a question of open access, it's open and, uh, and un understandable research to the, to the layman, which is the really powerful bit in terms of the open access and the translation and, and making it as widely available as possible. Thanks, Andrew. Maybe I'll jump in. Uh, I I agree entirely with what ev everything Andrew is saying. Um, I guess uh, the Wikipedia end of the universe definitely engaging with uh, the general public and general language, uh, but uh, not everything that has been said applies necessarily to us. So um, we are, are not able to write about ourselves certainly it's not about self-promoting nor even about necessarily our own research uh, but the the intent is to genuinely summarize others work um, like who was talking about uh, reviews and uh, meta studies um, so here uh, the issue of um, reward or something is really reduced down to to uh, some kind of self uh, sorry uh, and a non-rewarded system um, it really does need to be voluntary, which does uh, set up some issues with um, the distribution of edits. Uh, we, we, the traditional makeup of a Wikipedia editor would be an educated first world English speaking 17 to 40 year old male. Uh, and so there are, there are some uh, concerns that if, if there is no other reward uh, that, that there 
you will end up with writing biases and, and things like that. Uh, it's good to hear, Andrew, that um, uh, you mistrusted those who um, thought that academics can't write. I, I would encourage uh, all academics in the audience to, um, to believe in your ability to write and uh, even write to the layman. Uh, I think actually it's one of our responsibilities, uh, whether or not it's rewarded. So uh, go ahead and, and write. I think that that's a, a reasonable point because also um, one of the things that that uh, comes up a lot is this nebulous idea of the layman or this nebulous idea of the general public, um, which researchers and academics often use to encompass literally everyone who isn't a researcher and academic. And that, yeah, that includes medical practitioners, it includes uh, journalists, it includes policymakers and people making decisions about their own lives. Um, so actually, I'd quite like to get into a, a brief in the weeds question, because um, there's, there's, I guess, different tools for being able to make uh, information open access. And, and one of those tools are Creative Commons licenses. Um, and these often seem a, a sort of a very niche and technical aspect, but I, I think that they can have a significant effect on what open access actually ends up meaning in that uh, context. So, for example, the, the conversation uses a no derivatives license. Um, Wikipedia uses the share alike version. Academic journals use everything from a, a vanilla by attribution all the way through to non commercial and no derivatives restrictions. So. Um, I'm interested in the panel's thoughts on what the impact is of these different licenses and do they create any incompatibilities or unexpected barriers? Well, I'm happy to jump in to begin with. I think uh, one of the things we have to be careful about is um, particularly for research literature where it's something a little bit different to just um, normal, say, literature for entertainment or for, for news. And that is that this is the peer review process, which is attached to the research literature is absolutely critical and a foundation to how we can hold ourselves up as, as authorities or as experts. And so that makes the research, uh, the whole idea of uh, research literature or, or academic literature quite different to normal sorts of um, information that might have been created um, by, by a publishing process. And so that means that we need to make sure as researchers that we hold that trust and that that peer review process is something which people understand has been um, put in place and that they know when they read information that it is um, correct. It's, if there's been challenges about it, that it's able to link into the, the uh, different sorts of bits that lead to research publications such as corrigendums, which are corrections or uh, corrections themselves or comments from other researchers or bodies of work that are linked around it, such as the special event, special editions or special um, special focus issues and things like that that happen around particular research areas. And quite often there's news and views and commentaries and things like that that are attached to um, important research. So one of the things we have to think about then is when people access that research, can they know which version they've got? And this is one of the things that worries me a bit about um, different ways of accessing research literature other than by directly from the publisher is that it actually can be unclear as to whether it's a submitted version, say if it's green open access, whether it's an accepted version or whether it's a published version, which then you go into some, many of the versions of uh, copyright that go with that. And quite often it's with a delay of several, you know, 12 months or so. And um, as opposed to say gold open access, which has um, been, been paid for and is, hopefully is made available through the publisher. And it's, and I, th I think the thing that worries me with um, all these different versions or approaches to open access is uh, maintaining the integrity of research and how it connects into that wider body so that um, people are able to go to the core. We always ask people, uh, anyone looking at research literature to make sure they go to, or, or information, go to the actual place where it was created and, and get to the bottom of where it eventuated or evolved from as a way of really knowing whether you can trust that information. And I, I guess one of the things that concerns me is that when we look at all these different approaches that we end up with um, something which could lead to uh, a, 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 a lowering the quality of integrity and trust if things can go wrong by people using 
non-peer-reviewed information because they didn't realise where it came from and at what stage in its process it's been made available. Kathy, um, I completely agree with you. Um, you just finished with saying something which to me is the kind of critical issue for the future of information, which is provenance. In other words, um, who is the publisher? And I think um, who the publisher is, is going to be, become really critical in terms of whether or not you decide to switch on the tap of information from that uh, outlet or not. Um, and, you know, perhaps when we move into the second part uh, uh, around trust, we can talk a little bit more about that. Um, in terms of Creative Commons, um, which, by the way, um, I think is just one of the most important developments in, in the Internet age in terms of dissemination of information. Um, and away, by the way, I should say, from paywalled information, um, which, which is um, a real issue, which, again, we can get into if we want to. The critical issue around um, uh, around Creative Commons is, um, as, as you said, Thomas, at the outset, at the conversation, we had a non-attribution policy, which means that the words that were agreed with the author and published can only be used um, fully um, and can't be reworked or remixed. Um, the problem with that approach, and by the way, largely speaking, it's, it's an excellent approach, but there is a problem, and that is that if you write 800 words and, um, and somebody else wants to use that, they can't use it unless they publish all 800 words. And sometimes, you know, there isn't room to publish 800 or whatever. But it does mean that the integrity of the article is kept, um, which is critical. Um, there's a new project I'm working on at Monash University, which will take a slightly different approach, um, just because what we're trying to do is make sure as many people as possible can use the information, but I can go into that um, later on, perhaps. But um, that integrity is key, and the one way you can ensure um, that, that that is there is exactly, again, um, as Cathy said, which is make sure that even if you reduce uh, or re-edit the copy, that you still uh, retain the link to the original research wherever it was initially published. Yeah, so Prue, what does the does the NHMRC have um, have kind of opinions as to these aspects? I wanted to um, follow up on this link between um, the record of publishing and integrity matters, if I could to just keep that line of um, mm. conversation going, um, because I think one of the real benefits of open access is this kind of transparency over what is published. But also we're getting into this space where things, versions are changing. So we've seen the big rise of, a rise of preprints, for example. Um, but one of the real strengths of the preprint model, preprint servers, and indeed of a lot of the institutional repository models is there is a unique digital ID in a single location. So while versions will change over time, you'll always be directed um, from any link to the most up-to-date version. Um, and I understand most preprint servers will let you see previous versions and what's changed to get that sense too. But it's a strong mechanism actually to improve the, the quality and the integrity of that particular piece of research um, over time, over a short period of time, because then it kind of becomes dated and you need to start the research from scratch again. Um, but it can be a, a process that will actually strengthen the integrity of research. But the gap are possibly um, in the broader understanding is making sure people understand the limitations of any particular type of model um, and type of research output. Uh, so that when preprints are used and what we've seen over the last two years in the COVID pandemic is a huge increase in citation of preprints, particularly in the media and in policy making. Less so actually in academic, though that has increased as well, but in other kind of um, scientific communication, we're seeing a rise of referencing to preprints. So it's important that people understand the exact limitations on that type of research. Um, so actually kind of almost educating everyone. And I think sometimes that even includes scientists, but definitely educating the other types of audiences um, of 
what, what does good research practice look like so that people can assess for themselves the quality of the research and have some sort of understanding um, of whether or not it is valid um, research in addition to the peer review process that we, we rely on. In a way, this is kind of trying to address the scientific disinformation and miscommunication that we're seeing is actually helping people be more critical in how they receive the, the various forms of information. Um, so that was a, the stream I wanted to kind of follow on there from that conversation. So I suppose Wikipedia's um, point of view in this is that uh, we're willing to stand back and wait a little. Uh, it's a tertiary source. We're happy to wait till things are published and uh, properly approved. Um, so I, I guess I'm not worried about submitted or preprints. Um, although I, I agree with Prue that obviously if if one is ever cited, we, we need the DOI to eventually re redirect to the right place. So uh, that should work. Um, the, the points Andrew touched on uh, about a no derivatives license uh, can certainly constrain our use of materials. So um, similarly, any non-commercial limitations will prevent things from being used on Wikipedia or Wikimedia systems. So uh, for example, if you're interested in your figure being available and, and made use of, um, then I guess we'd argue for an even, op even more open license to, to make sure it can be used. Um, with attribution, but uh, no restraints on commercial use. So, I mean, everyone has touched on this, this aspect of um, transparency and trust um, and, and partly linked to versioning, partly linked to provenance, um, partly linked to the whole process of how research is done and then how the research publication process is done. Um, so I guess what do, uh, my question is, what do people think uh, are the necessary changes that are going to have to occur in the future to ensure that we retain trust in trustworthy information sources? Well, I feel like I'll start there. Um, I think uh, we have to remember that uh, the peer review process is absolutely critical and that it's one which is done in a way which is trusted so that it's managed with uh, making sure that there's no uh, conflicts of interest, that there's, uh, there's no possibility of people feeling that uh, things are getting slipping through because of personal connections, you know, that sometimes uh, that, that, that aspect of that process is often not well understood. And if you look at, at the value of any um, research journal, the value of it, say, for, for a particular publisher is very much dependent on the quality of the research that is submitted. And that's obtained by quality peer review, the editorial, the quality of the material that is submitted. And if you go through looking at where that information came from, the first one is that research is submitted in written form, which is being funded usually from um, the public purse. So, uh, so that it, so that's the first thing. So the material is is paid for by someone else. Then the second is the peer review is done uh, where there's no payment, which I think is very important because that removes a conflict of interest of any sort. And hopefully the journals have and the, the role of the journal is not just hopefully it is absolutely essential that it's uh, done in a way that has the integrity and the requirements to keep it at, at the highest possible level. The edit editors and the editorial boards are usually top researchers who are, are leaders in their particular fields who have reputation and that brings um, part of the branding and the reputation of the journal. And, um, and so they usually get a small stipend that doesn't cover anywhere near the, you know, the time committed uh, to be able to manage that aspect of it. And then there's the whole management and administration of it, which is uh, managed by publishers. And, uh, and, then we have, um, and then we have the whole you know, uh, metadata, the whole way of managing the, uh, the system is, is something which is, is uh, provided by, by the publishers. So when you look at this, the design of the, the research public or the academic publication system, it's actually quite different to anything else where you've got quite an uneven aspect to it where 
Uh, you've got much of the work is, which creates the, the product and the quality and the reputation is not paid for uh, or a minor, a minor payment. And, that, and then the, the actual administration and the, um, and the management of databases and the metadata and all the stuff that goes and discoverability and all those sorts of things which are critically important have got um, been placed with very high high value, and we know that um, that publishing research publishing is quite a profitable business. And so, I guess the thing which uh, I I'm, I would like to see is a rebalance of how that contribution that is coming from either the public purse or from individuals has um, a, a, bi a, a bigger sway in the balance so that we get um, that contribution being made more broadly available in, in I guess, the business model and, and contributions and how the re return from uh, the investment in, in publishing is that made available more broadly, which is why I'm keen on an open access model, which means that it's one where it's not just open access to other researchers, but open access to the broader community. Yeah, what, one thing, um, just a very general point I'd like to make is that um, the, um, the way in which bad information um, can harm people's lives and actually cost lives um, has been really made much more explicit over the last uh, couple of years by both uh, the pandemic, but also by, for example, the storming of the Capitol on January the 6th. Um, and we're only just now learning where that bad information came from. Um, you know, Facebook is finally facing up that it carried a lot of it. And, and um, the sort of bad players out there um, have really come to the fore. And what it's done is it's really forced people to look um, much more closely now at, at uh, with what is the bad information, how you can identify it, how you can try and avoid it. Um, or there are examples now of ways to defund players uh, who are out there who are receiving a lot of advertising dollars, by the way, uh, for putting out uh, you know, very poor or polluted uh, information. And I think that's forcing all of us to just really rethink the whole content supply chain as to where you get it from, whether or not you should be consuming it. I mean, I always use the analogy like, you know, uh, clean water. So when you switch your tap on, you, you assume that certain tests have been carried out uh, downstream so that when you do switch it on, it's potable, reliable and safe to use. But the same thing goes for bad information, you know, bad polluted information, as I said earlier, can actually cost lives or be extremely damaging. Um, now, the interesting thing about universities and CSIRO as well is that underpinning uh, the, the way in which all knowledge is created is strict uh, codes of conduct um, in terms of how you conduct your research, um, how you have to um, ensure that you disclose uh, where, who funds that research if you've got any conflicts. And these, these are all uh, documented and things like the Singapore uh, agreement on, on research, uh, the conduct of research. Um, there, are, there are so many checks and balances there, which actually demonstrate that the, the work coming out of publicly funded universities and, and research institutions like CSIRO are much more dependable and reliable um, than anywhere else. And, and for that reason, I just think we've got to find a way to bring um, the universities and CSIRO to become seen as a trusted new actor in the provision of information because of their responsibilities to get things right and not be driven by ideological or commercial imperatives. I mean, uh, Andrew mentioned um, uh, as part of that the the clean water analogy for good information. Um, and there's another analogy that that reminds me of, which is the open kitchen model for, for science. You know, if you go into a restaurant, if people can think back that far for those of us uh, in long-term lockdown, um, lots of restaurants allow you to see into the kitchen to see how your food is made. And that's another way of engendering trust in, in the final product. Um, 
and uh, Toby, Wikipedia seems to take a pretty radical position on that that sort of transparency, right? I even have the word radical in my notes. Yes, I, I suppose we're looking for um, even more radical transparency than the peer review process would uh, usually have. Uh, so for us, uh, it needs to be open to write, to read, to audit, to critique, and to actually change, to update if something is is out of date. Uh, so this is this is a, a living document. It's um, changeable and updatable all the time, which obviously needs means we need a big commitment to neutrality and verifiability and citations and and um, really making sure we can get all the way back up the ladder uh, to those reliable sources that have been peer reviewed. Um, so that's all crucial and embedded in Wikipedia. Um, I, I guess uh, this need to fact check other people's uh, references um, is, is something that I, I've seen um, falling over in the pandemic a little bit. Uh, so, um, and, and I think this prom problem is across uh, journalism. So I, I've communicated with well-meaning and fair-minded members of the public who were maybe confused or even misled by what were actually fair-minded journalists reporting uh, but because the study that the journalist was quoting or sometimes misquoting uh, was actually inaccessible to the public they couldn't properly interrogate that so um, obviously we need to be linking back to our sources but those sources need to be available uh, for proper critique uh, the way we do it uh, the way we do our transparency on wikipedia is basically that every single edit is uh his, it's archived and, and the history is publicly available. Uh, so it's all quite, um, you can see what a user has been editing and you can see their entire track record uh, if you need to interrogate what's what's going on. And if there's a bad actor, then that can be tracked down, although it, it may not always be immediately obvious. Yeah, Prue. Yeah, if I can add to that within the you know, scholarly publication, um, space it's still important that we have a system that's constantly open to um, criticism or questioning of of the quality and the validity of scientific findings and sometimes that's done by replicating studies to see if you can re reproduce the results but it's also done by corrections and retractions to existing published work you know while i agree 110 percent with kathy that the integrity of our peer review system and the importance of peer review is is absolutely critical it's also not infallible and there are um corrections that that happen in the published space um what we should be proud of is that that happens by exception rather than as a standard thing so those checks and balances um don't pick up you know huge problems um but what's really important is those checks and balances are there um and that kind of um that kind of integrity built into the system is there. And of course, uh, anything where um, poor research practices is found to be deliberate or deliberate misinformation uh, or distorting of scientific findings, then there are real repercussions um, for researchers um, under the um, framework for managing research integrity and research misconduct. So I think that's an important part of the system that needs to be maintained as well. Uh, can I add to that? Is um, that absolutely correct? For is that the the importance I think of any research journal is that uh, anything particularly where there's been a question about um, the research itself or uh, the conclusions that are being drawn from the research that's presented. That comments process is a very important one, and you can see different areas will have more of that because of the contention of the particular research that's under under consideration. But the other thing that's really interesting is with open um, data, we're seeing uh, a real shift in a different way of analysing it in two ways. One is providing data sets that others can learn from, which teachers, whether it's in high school or university, are finding really valuable because that gives uh, real examples of um, students to be able to work their way through and, and hone their skills. But the other, which I think is even more important is, and we've seen this recently in my own area of research, of um, some work that was done um, by a very high quality research team on topological insulators, where they were looking at um, a paper published in Nature, it was seen as you know, breakthrough stuff relating to quantum computing. And uh, the data, people tried to replicate it, 
they couldn't. And so then they asked for the original data, which they were able to access. They actually went through and reanalyzed it and found that they felt that the researchers had made some errors in the way they went analyzing their data. The researchers went back and were horrified to realize that they had not um, you know, analyzed the data as in a correct way. And so the paper was withdrawn. And that I thought was excellent science. And science was, you know, sort of reporting science at its best. It wasn't because of anyone trying to do the wrong thing or diddle the books or anything. It was just human error. And that whole process I thought was one which really highlighted the strength of um, open science, not just open access, but open data as well. And um, and bringing and seeing how that's all brought together um, through you know what I see as a, a full clean open access system for me is only going to add to the strength of our research community. I mean, I, I think that that's really interesting in in how um, how that really affects the the research ecosystem and and how it's how it's performed and how it's reported on. Um, but for all of these things, they're, they're always affected by the predominant business models. Um, and I think for both academic publishing and textbook publishing and journalistic publishing, there's been this trend over the last few decades towards uh, consolidation into a, a smaller and smaller number of larger and larger publishers. Um, so I'm interested in whether this causes any problems, um, and in particular, if it does, what can we actually do to mitigate those? Um, so starting with with Andrew, I guess from from the um, journal, uh, the the newspaper publishing point of view, and then hearing from others for what it means for for the academic publishing sphere. Um, thanks. Um, look. Um... To me, uh, the situation in Australia is probably one of the worst in the world in, in terms of a liberal democracy, um, where we have uh, the greatest, I, mean, I arrived in Australia in 2004 to come and edit The Age, and I, was, uh, I just couldn't believe the concentration of ownership back then, but let me tell you, it's much, much worse now. Um, I, the Age used to be owned by a company called Fairfax, um, that that doesn't even exist anymore as part of Nine Entertainment. So it went from Fairfax Media to Nine Entertainment, which it now sits uh, within. Um, and News Corp back then didn't have Sky After Dark or Sky TV and Sky After Dark. And the reach of, of Sky's um, YouTube channel uh, is much bigger than anything else. Uh, although the majority of, of the YouTube channel uh, viewership is from the US. And that's because we have some of the best um, climate or anti-climate science warriors and also COVID science warriors in this country. Um, so there, there, there's massive viewership of that. Um, and it, it causes a real problem. If, if you go back to the ACCC uh, reports, which I was, I was uh, involved in as well, um, you can, and I, I mentioned this earlier, if you look at the funding for, for journalism or media in this country, um, it's now 60 to 70% in, uh, uh, owned by Google and Facebook when it comes to the advertising dollars. So there is a real problem. And I, I put forward a different approach, which, is, um, which wasn't finally accepted by the ACCC, which is more like a levy on Google and Facebook and to say, look, you take out of this country an enormous amount of money, we're going to put a, a levy of, say, 10% on the six or seven billion a year that you bring in, and we're going to redistribute that to cover the areas of market failure. And that market failure is really in, in rural reporting, rural and regional reporting, in specialist reporting, and by that I mean science, uh, health, environment, and so on and so forth, but also in coverage of our major institutions, such as parliaments, courts, police matters, and so on and so forth. Um, and also to allow new entrants to actually um, to, to gain access into the marketplace. So there is a real problem in this country. And in many ways, the power, particularly of News Corp, which owns, you know, uh, as I said, not just the newspapers, but Foxtel and Sky and so on and so forth, um, the, the, there is a real issue there, and that issue is, has been highlighted by Malcolm Turnbull and Kevin Rudd as well through his demands for a commission. 
and it is really distorting the way the market operates this country in terms of free flow of information. It's a real concern and, um, and it has a real impact in, in all sorts of areas, including, of course, the um, hostility that News Corp has and has had to climate science for a long time. I know it's had a, a sort of a deathbed conversion, but it's hostility towards universities and the funding of, of, of um, public universities, the funding of the ABC, and so it goes on. Well, it, it's, it's a real issue that we face in this country. Thankfully, we can all still access overseas websites and, and information sources, uh, which does somewhat mitigate that problem. But nonetheless, um, in, in terms of the bulk of people in this country, they get their information from their local talkback radio or the local um, uh, um, newspapers, tabloids, and, and, and so on and so forth. So it is a real issue. Um, and um, my only, my last comment I would just make is that the way to mitigate some of this, there are new ways of mitigating it. One of them is through defunding those bad sources. If you remember Alan Jones on 2GB when he made certain statements, uh, advertisers just boycotted uh, that, that station and then they had to make amends. That is a real big new movement which is evolving led by an, uh, an outfit in the UK called Global Disinformation Index. And what they do is they send reports to advertisers of bad actors and advertisers now are defunding some of those bad actors. So there, there is some um, attempt now to try and tame the wild west of information. But right here in Australia, I, I do worry about our ability to conduct uh, rational uh, discussions about the big issues that face this country. Sorry for the rant. I, I mean, I realize that we're coming up to time, unfortunately. Um, I, I would like to give space for, for um, either Pru or Kathy to give a quick comment on the academic publishing side of things before we do our final wrap up. Um, Prue, go ahead. Yeah, well, when we think about um, the concentration into a small number of publishing houses, I think it also um, forces us to think about the question of how we transition into an open access system more broadly. Um, and the need to be wary of a single, single monolithic solution um, and how we can put the decision about how we transition more in the hands of the community that creates research and those the, who use it uh, as well, who it serves, um, rather than in those with kind of the wealth and power within the existing system. Um, you know, wealth and power includes research funders like myself, um, but it also includes the main publishing houses. Um, and there, there is risks that we simply entrench a lot of the in, in existing equity issues that we may have within the system um, where um, the primary negotiating power rests with those with the kind of wealth and power now. Um, so I think that's just kind of an issue to keep in mind as we go forward into a new system about making sure that there's um, opportunities for innovation, new models, possibly models we haven't even thought of yet, um, and having multiple things going on at once so that we have those opportunities in the future. Thank you. Uh, and thank you, everyone. I think with that, we are going to have to wrap up for time at this point. Um, so I just wanted to... Uh, thank again our excellent panelists, both for their time and for their insights. Um, if you've enjoyed this, please do check out the uh, events that are available for the rest of this week on um, oaaustralasia.org. So, for example, tomorrow uh, we're taking a look at how research assessment as a process shapes practices. Uh, and there's also uh, an open access themed escape room challenge. Um, for events throughout the rest of the week, uh, there's going to be a broad range of different aspects ranging from uh, research concepts through a First, First Nations lens through to similarities and differences between um, different uh, research fields uh, and the rise of open education material. Um, so please do check those out. Uh, and I hope to see you all uh, later on in this week. Uh, but yes, thank you again to our fantastic panelists. Uh, Toby Hudson, Prue Torrance, Andrew Jaspin, and Kathy Foley.